So I thought we could start this session with some guidance and as usual feel, please feel free to follow the guidance if you wish, consider it an invitation but if you have your own type of meditation that you prefer or that works for you or that just feels more relevant for you at this time please respect your mind and go with that otherwise We'll do a little bit of reflection and imagination and see if we can get some inspiration up. And after that, Venerable Upeka will give a Dhamma reflection and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Since it is a kind of Vesak celebration, which is usually something that happens in monasteries, but I think there are more of you on the screen than there are in this monastery. There was actually five people here though, so we're doing pretty well. Um, because it's usually a social time, we thought we'd give you the option, if you want to, to do some small group discussion for just seven minutes or so. Um, but I might do a little kind of head count of how many people want to do that and how many people prefer just to have a and a session um, to give you the option. And even if, you, if we do the discussion, but you don't want to join it, you can just wait in the main room. You don't have to join, so but please don't leave because we really hope that we can end this evening with all of you here. Uh, so let's just settle ourselves down and find a really, really comfortable posture, because often a lot of attention is given to being alert and being still and not enough to being comfortable. So we're trying to find somewhere in between that's both comfortable and that keeps you awake, with the exception of people who are exhausted because sometimes you just want a bit of downtime and it's the only time you can get and that's valid as well so if you do want to lie down or find a really comfy sofa that's really fine i see some of you have the wisdom to already be in a comfortable armchair there's cream yeah hello lovely to see you so Gently and slowly withdrawing the senses and if you're comfortable to do so, closing your eyes. Perhaps noticing a breath, I notice a really deep breath, almost at the relief of breathing in the excitement and inspiration but also letting it go and just coming into myself landing in your body landing with the support of the ground perhaps the support of your chair and allowing your muscles your limbs to relax And this could be a good time to just gently scan through your body to check whether you've really placed your limbs, your knees, your feet, your back in a good position or whether they would benefit from being slightly adjusted so that nothing is pinching or tight. clothing is not too constricting perhaps paying attention to your knees the areas that take some of the strain or the buttocks to see that the weight is more or less evenly distributed between the two buttocks Checking into your spine. All the way up to the base of the skull. And just allowing the head to gently balance on the neck.
perhaps tilting slightly forward if that's comfortable. And then noticing the shoulders, the places we hold a lot of tension. Perhaps shrugging them or gently rolling them back. Sometimes that means you need to adjust the position of your hands. And taking care not to suppress any urges. Sometimes there's a bit of a tickle in the throat or a need to sneeze. <laughs> you can do that now if you wish. We can't hear you anyway. And just sensing that you're in a friendly and safe space. As safe as it can be right now. And feeling gladness that you've made the choice, the wise intention to give this gift of practice to yourself today, inspired by the Buddha on the eve of his, or the anniversary of his enlightenment and his passing into Parinibbana, the greatest gift he could give to this world. Just settling into this present moment. Allowing the sensations to bring you into the here and now. Allowing the mind to settle down just by letting it be. Allowing the thoughts to be just like clouds, maybe gentle, wispy clouds in the sky. with space around them. Space that is quiet and calm. So if you wish, you can just continue enjoying this peace, the peace of letting things be. Or if you like, we can walk together through a little imaginary scenario. It may help you be more at ease and inspired. So 
So just imagining, if you wish, that you're in a beautiful forest. The sunlight beaming through the leaves. The ground soft beneath your feet. Perhaps the sound of birds. Or the waft of flowers blooming on the trees. This forest feels safe and protected. And you follow a little stream through the undergrowth. Sensing that you're coming to a quiet place where there's a sense of loving kindness that's drawing you on. And as you meander through these woods, you realize there's someone seated under a tree, deep in the forest, in a clearing. And there's a light emanating from this being. An inviting and warm glow. A glow of loving kindness, compassion, safety and peace. And you realize that this is the Buddha himself. And you know there's nothing to fear. A sense of inspiration, pity, delight fills up your body and mind and with folded hands you slowly and humbly approach this being and take a seat to one side It's as though the Buddha sees you but barely moves. Just gently raises the lids of his eyes to let you know he sees you. And you sit together in peace. And all your tensions, your concerns start slipping, melting away.
as you start to imbibe some of the peace, the contentment. The sense of being deeply seen and understood, not judged in any way. Notice the body relaxing into deeper levels of calm. And the mind becoming still. In the presence of the Buddha, there's nothing to say. You're just soaking up that sense of deep freedom and peace. Whatever arises in the body or the mind is already accepted, already forgiven, understood as simply causes and conditions arising and passing away. There cannot be any ownership. cannot be any me or mine. There's just this wisdom. Of a Buddha. Who understands the world. And regards the world outside, inside. regards you with nothing but kindly, compassionate eyes. An aspect of nature. Nothing more. And the only thing to do is to care.
and you allow some of this relief, some of this peace to enter your heart and bring you to a place of contentment. Nothing more to be done. After some time you realize you've been sitting here with the Buddha for a long, long time. And it's now time to pay respects and leave. Gently standing up and walking a few steps back. But knowing your heart's been changed, you felt that sense of true acceptance. That will stay with you and teach you to accept love and forgive yourself. And you remember those wisdom eyes of the Buddha who knows that just as he had the capacity to awaken, so do you. left with a new sense of confidence and trust. So 
So just allowing this little scenario to fade and coming more in contact with your body sitting here. Noticing how you feel now compared to when you began. Whether there's even a little bit more contentment and ease, a softening in the heart. Or not, that's okay too. Just noticing the cause for any peace that you now feel through the simple practice of meditation. Staying connected to that. I'll now ring the gong. You might notice the sound of the gong reverberating in your body and mind. And at the end of the gong, you may gently open your eyes. still ringing. You want to see my bell? It's huge. I think this is from Gunter actually, isn't it? It's really nice. It's not as huge as Kareem's. I've been to Kareem's house. He's got a really huge one. But this is lovely. It's kind of, I don't know, it must have been made by hand. And even when it, I think even now I can touch it and there's still a kind of vibration there. It's really nice. <sighs> so I hope that was somewhat enjoyable <laughs> and help you relax mm -hmm. and settle into this session together. We're just going to plug in our charger actually and then I'll invite Venerable Pekka to give a little talk. So, it's all good to disappear but we don't want you to disappear. So, could you do the plug for me? <laughs> you did the bed again. <laughs> Great. All right. Start? Yeah. Okay, just start. Okay. So, um, today is Vesak day, and uh, well, I remember as a child being born in Sri Lanka, Vesak was a very exciting day because <laughs> it was full of lights, and and uh, we all made a, a lantern. That was like the highlight, making the lantern. And then you got to wear white. And uh, it was really fun because going to the temple, it was very quiet. And uh, there were just uh, it, and, and, uh, all these 
families, everyone come to the temple dressed in white. And um, when, when uh, well, I didn't live, for Sri Lanka, in, live in Sri Lanka long after that we moved to Singapore. But still being a good Buddhist, my mother used to take us to the temple and we still made lanterns <laughs> and we still had lights. <laughs> and here I am at the age of 48 celebrating Vesak again. And where are the lanterns? There. <laughs> yeah. There. In your heart. Yeah. So, um, so Vesak, I, I, I was just uh, um, reflecting on, you know, coming, being born a Buddhist and now living here, coming to visit the UK. What, how we can relate to it, because there are no lanterns. <laughs> Not sure if you're into lanterns. But, and how, uh, how Vesa can be significant to someone who was not born a Buddhist and who is, uh, uh, doesn't have that culture of, of uh, celebrating Vesa and how we can make it something that is part of our lives, even, even though we are not in a country with lanterns, <laughs> in a Buddhist country. Uh, so that's what I thought I'd re we'd reflect on today, how to make Vesakti and the significance of the Buddha being born 2,500 years ago, how it is something that is important to us today and how we can make it a source of, well, the meaning of our lives at the end, for me anyway, the meaning of the, my life that the Buddha was born 2,500 years ago. So, so I just invite you to think on, on how how we how how we can how we relate to the Buddha as a person, how um, his being born two thousand five hundred years ago is important to us today. And the first thing that came to my mind, because just like perhaps all of you, is that I was searching for something. I was searching for something, even though I was born a Buddhist. There were there's a lot of tradition and ritual around Buddhism, which you you just Sometimes you wonder where the where Buddhism was there, but there. <laughs> um, but uh, the, uh, there's something deep inside in all of us that is looking. We know something is not quite right. What? Why is everybody getting married, having children, building houses, getting old, getting sick, dying, and if you if I was taught about rebirth, doing it all over again. So, what, um, this is what the Buddha was also questioning, just like us. What, we are searching for something. We are searching for something. Something we know is much more important, much more profound um, about this human existence. So, so I think uh, we have all come here probably out of faith and uh, a longing for that understanding in ourselves. So what, what uh, the Buddha was born in India, in a very spiritually potent climate where there were a lot of people asking this question, what is moksha, what is liberation? Because even though the Vedas had been um, the Vedic teaching of, of rituals and sacrifice, uh, around about 500 years before the time of the, the, the Buddha was born, there were, uh, there were uh, like uh, the Upanishads started around that time. I think the earliest Upanishads were around then. And the Vedic ritual was being questioned, you know, who, who, is, who is Brahman? Who is, uh, what is this Atman? Who is the self? Who, who is, um, who am I in relation to Brahma? And these questions were being asked and there were a lot of people coming up with some really extraordinary theories. So it must have been a hell of a fun place to be, I reckon. <laughs> uh, as it is, India is today. It's a hell of a fun place to be. <laughs> Sometimes. Because <laughs> people are still, still asking these questions and and nobody's stopping them. Nobody's saying, you know, we found the answer. Don't you know that we, the revelation? No, no, the spirit of inquiry. It's, it's, uh, 
still very much alive in our hearts and in India today. So that's the, that's the environment in which the Buddha was born. Um, in, and that's why probably he was born in India, because uh, it, that's a place of inquiry, a place of searching a deep, uh, uh, just, just whoever you are, as long as you're seeking, seeking the truth, you will be fed. <laughs> And uh, that's, that's what the Buddha saw. So as we all know, uh, he was a, a prince like us, probably. We are living princely <laughs> lives. We do not really, for most of us, uh, see death. There was a little boy who came yesterday, and his father was trying to explain to him, a little five-year-old boy, he does not know what death is. And so it is when you walk down the streets of Oxford, what makes you think that death exists? What makes you think that old age exists? We are hidden from all these things in our world. And so when the Buddha saw this for the first time, uh, sickness, we all get shocked. Why did I get sick? Why do I have cancer? Why did someone get, why did my father get cancer? How? So all these things, the Buddha also you know, recognized that were, uh, unavoidable and yet we also run away from them thinking if we try hard enough I won't get sick I won't feel the pains of bad knees and <laughs> bad backs and yet it happens and yet it happens so um, so the last thing the Buddha saw was the sight so we all know the story. Do we know the story? Well, I'm sure you know the story of the four sites before the Buddha, before he uh, decide, decided to leave the household life, was seeing an old person, seeing a sick person, and seeing a dead person. And so those were his heavenly messengers. Are they our heavenly messengers? Are they our heavenly messengers? So... Huh? The, fourth. the fourth one, yeah. So the fourth one was the sight of a summoner, the sight of a renunciate. And that is the gift that we offer. We're not exactly enlightened, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, perhaps in all of us, when we see a robed figure, the other day we were walking down, uh, the, we were walking along the Thames and three Catholic nuns were coming in the opposite direction and it made us so, so happy, you know. There's a renunciate, there is someone who sees something else in life. So the sight of a summoner is very profound. So it wakes up in us, something else is out there, something that the world isn't telling me. So uh, this is what the Buddha saw. And, and despite being a prince with his parents crying, he had a child by then and a very uh, well, pretty uh, crazy thing to do, but <laughs> to leave his wife and child and family, a bit of a crazy thing to do perhaps, and walk out into the forest leaving, leaving everything behind because this search for the truth was so powerful as it is for us, as it should be for us because that's the kind of renunciation that it takes you to the end. The, search for leaving everything behind, leaving everything behind, because the search for the truth is so important, don't you think? Yes, which is why we're here, <laughs> even though it's a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, um, um, but um, yes, yeah, so not all of us necessarily kind of connect to the Buddha, but we connect also, so often I connect to the Sangha when I see someone who is a very different person, something that they seem, you know, like uh, really a John Brown, I guess. Or, uh, um, you know, but now there are YouTube t videos, you can find them anywhere. <laughs> uh, that t spiritual people who you go, that is my connection. That is what that is what I can recognize as what the qualities that the Buddha might have. So, find I guess your own way of of relating to this truth. You know, 
waking it up in yourself. Sometimes it's reading the suttas, reading the word of the Buddha that you go, that is just, thank God someone said that, you know. <laughs> Life is suffering. <sighs> thank God. <laughs> someone admitted it. <laughs> it can't all be fixed up. Uh, so reading the, reading the Dhamma also is a way of connecting to this uh, person that was born 2,500 years. So we all have ways, and I encourage you to, to find that connection, because it, is, it does wake it up in, inside yourself. So you, something inside of you recognizes, recognizes the, an enlightened person, recognizes the Dhamma. It, you, you just know it's right. So, um, uh, so anyway, that is, that is how the Buddha started. And so he went on a search. He went on a search and, uh, um, yeah, let me look at my notes. He went on a search and we all go on a search and he searched, like I said, in India there was all kinds of people doing all kinds of things and the most popular was ascetic practices and and we do this too you know no pain no gain it seems to be that we still have that uh that uh mentality that if you just sit through it if you sit up all night if you starve yourself not starve yourself you know eat little sleep little talk little live in really dire circumstances almost uh, well freezing to death whatever it is if we practice this way that somehow that leads to liberation and so the buddha spent six years almost you know, living on a grain of rice, I don't know, well, so he says, a grain of rice, um, um, eating fecal, dogs poo, animal poo, and, uh, and, and that was, that was what, that's really what we do. We, we, we think that if we push ourselves hard enough and we, uh, uh, you know, sit through, sit through the pain, if I just grit my teeth, that somehow I will get enlightened. <laughs> and so he tried so many different practices. And uh, the other practice at the time that was, I mean, quite extraordinary were the, the immaterial attainments. He seemed to be obviously quite good at it, but those were the other great practices at the time of Alara Kalama and Uddhakaramaputta who were, um, who were, seemed like very refined beings, that they had attained to the eighth jhana, seventh jhana, the perception of, I mean, my goodness, perception of, no, what is it? Neither perception nor perception. What does that even mean? Anyway, so the, it's, uh, Places where when they die, they end up in eons of bliss, in these states of such um, nothingness, but so hard to, yeah, so, so, uh, such extraordinary mind states. Venerable Chanda, we were talking earlier on about Ayurvedic practices and how, uh, how, how, some of these understandings of the workings of a particular medicine, how they can, how the, uh, the rishis of, of ancient India, how they could have possibly worked out how a piece of turmeric passes through your body, its exact effect on, 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 uh, um, on, on a disease and how things work together anyway. That is the power of the mind, and that was that is the powers that the mind can have when well in the, at that time in India. So, so these are the things; these are the people that the the Buddha met, and us too. I mean, we we still have such people around, and um, uh, 
uh, also yeah have the fortune to meet great people who have who have extremely refined minds who we do 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 admire like perhaps Jesus Christ he must have had an extraordinary mind as well to be so compassionate and forgiving so there are there are there are great human beings to this day who we emul who we come across and we hear about just like the buddha did and yet it was not enough for him and yet he went to the ends of those practices and found i still suffer i still come out of those experiences and i'm still prone to attachment badly thought of his wife <laughs> i'm still prone to um uh desire i'm still prone to birth death old age and sickness and so he continued he continued until he found the very end of suffering and so he we find him we find him just like us well in search he had same problems he he had desire he had the one of the last things that he as he sat under the bodhi tree was mara must be a great friend of the internet anyway <laughs> mara he must have created the internet anyway <laughs> mara um trying his last ploys before he got enlightened so mara is ex he, he he really he doesn't have to work very hard in this day and age <laughs> but he's around you know he's around stopping us and turning us in the other in the other way and there the subtlest of things what is one of his temptations was of uh he said to the buddha why you why you bothering with this why don't you be a rule a, 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 a what a world ruling monarch a world ruling monarch and so we also would like that if only we can solve climate change if only our prime ministers were doing the right thing if only the un you know united nations would op we would operate as one big happy planet so this is our strangely mara's delusion that if we are have the ability the power the intelligence the kindness the compassion that somehow we can make the world just right so the uh the um that is one of our great great mars ploys as well that you can build a perfect monastery <laughs> <laughs> even it's not perfect <laughs> <laughs> yeah have everybody living happily together the sangha in harmony alas <laughs> we are still still human beings um and the other other Tempt temptation mara mara has was with i mean really the 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 desires that we all have deep inside us you know imagine the buddha sending a, his three daughters who would think but still that was what tempted the buddha lust or desire inside of us all something that just wants to procreate perhaps yeah that the desire to uh to enjoy the sense world enjoy the sense world and so so these are the temptations that all of us all of us have to turn away from and that the buddha did sitting under the bodhi tree after eating his first meal of rice and milk rice which which was offered by visaka sujata oh sujata sorry sujata uh yeah that we are comfortable not too comfortable as we sit down to meditate just that right amount of comfort before we sit down to meditate so 
So thank you very much. So, five oh, five minutes, my goodness. <laughs> wow. Excellent. I was worried about getting to the end. <laughs> now I see you too. So yeah, so, and so he sat under the Bodhi tree and realized enlightenment. That is the, wasn't it convenient? He was born, he was enlightened, and he attained Parinibbana on the same day. And so he was enlightened on, the, on a Vesak day as well. Um, so what did he realize? What did he, what did he see as he sat under the Bodhi tree? And we all think the Four Noble Truths, he saw the Eightfold Noble Path, but what he also saw was Kamma and Rebirth. That was one of his great insights, because contrary to popular belief, Kamma was not an established uh, norm in India at that time. Like I said, there were a lot of debates and lots of theories. Kamma wasn't necessarily always accepted. And what, that was one of his great realizations that helped him to, to, um, to, be, to turn away from the world. He saw beings being born and dying, and born and dying over and over again. He saw with his own eye, because that was the power of his mind then. And he saw the workings of Kama, how their actions is what took them to the next destination. It wasn't a, a, some kind of random uh, occurrence that some is born poor, somebody's born rich, someone's born um, an animal, someone's born a human being. That karma is the reason that we go on and on and on. And what we do makes a difference. Our mm -hmm. intentions and our actions have tremendous impact. So he saw those to, in, I mean, un, under-emphasized uh, insights of karma and rebirth, and the, that sansara is endless. He looked back he, to uh, 90 aeons or something like that and could not find a beginning to being born and dying over and over again. And so this was... Uh, I think a powerful reason to turn away when you see that your mind turns away and your mind sees what causes that to happen over and over again and it realizes, ah, this is how to turn away. And so he, re he, he, f um, he uh, saw craving at the root, craving at the root, craving not only for the sense world which we are completely embedded in, but ultimately the craving to exist, the craving to be, the craving and the craving not to be, tanha, bhava tanha and vibhava tanha, which is what, even though we say, oh, you know, I can give up this thing, that I can give it up. It's our sense of self that is driving all of this, our sense of I exist and I can do things to make fix it all up. So uh, at the bottom of his, his greatest realization was that there was nobody there. There was nobody there. And it was our clinging to the somebody being there that takes us on from life to life to life. And if only we can see through that, that it is just, there is nobody there. That, that is what um, takes us to liberation. So, I guess that's about half an hour. Uh, yeah, so and then also what he, what he created at the same time and uh, what attracts us a lot to the Dhamma is that he, there is a path because we hear of this, you know, div, you know, unnameable, undescribable uh, oneness of, 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 of the universe. I know all these epitaphs for all kinds of liberation. But what the Buddha didn't describe was that. What he did describe was a path. He did describe a path, which is something that is doable, that any of us 
mere mortals can recognize and go, I could do that. I could be generous. I could keep my precepts. You know, I could uh, restrain my speech. And so what the Buddha offered was a path to this entire ending of suffering. And so the Noble Eightfold Path is a great practice for all of us and something that we can do as opposed to kind of go, well, how do I get there, you know? And that great gift of the Noble Eightfold Path and the uh, uh, Noble Truths, that is the reason probably why we are all here because we kind of go, right, now I've got a method. <laughs> I've got something I can work with. So that's, a, that's I think, probably the greatest in, it's like a genius of the Buddha that he found a path mm. and a, a one that could be described in such simple words that any, any farmer, any illiterate peasant could understand. It was not a, you know, you didn't have to go to Oxford and get a PhD <laughs> to become an enlightened person. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, yeah, I hope you find inspiration in the Buddha's life and he, what, he, what he has given us. 2000, that 2,500 years here we are in a completely different land, coming together and practicing his teachings, which in the end what is, was his greatest gift. So, so yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> I feel inspired <laughs> and happy. And uh, so we still have 15 minutes, and uh, before we end, I'd like to give people an opportunity to ask questions or share any reflections. Uh, about the topic or about the chat that you just had or about the meditation, whatever it is. Um, it's an opportunity to connect, to share, to maybe get advice or... Yeah, Kim. So what happens here is that you won't be videoed but your voice will be recorded. <clears throat> so if that's okay for you, you can unmute. Otherwise, people can also write something in the chat. There's only 15 minutes, so we'll keep it a little bit brief. So we'll go to Kim. Thank you. Thank you both so much and, and to the Sangha. Um, yes, I'm really, um, I don't know much about Vesak and um, I'm just interested to learn more and I've really enjoyed tonight. Um, I kind of have a bit more of a question about my practice and daily life. And it, but it was um, sort of triggered by what's been shared. This thing that I have that is that searching and, you know, trying to be around people who are on the path, I can sometimes feel that I'm more distant from people in my daily life. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I don't know if you have anything to say around that because I feel like my practice really is to m help me connect with people but if they don't want to hear about the suffering or, <laughs> or death and sickness, and, um, I find it hard to connect on sort of the day-to-day -day level that lots of us have to, you know, yeah. do live by. So, yeah, thank you. So I think it's natural, especially in the beginning of the practice, because you're starting to change, but the people around you are not. So the ones that you maybe felt connected to in the beginning, now you feel a little bit distant from because you have different values. And there's this kind of difficult phase where you haven't yet replaced, uh, not replaced in a kind of callous way, but you haven't yet met your spiritual friends. And so there's a little bit of a void where you feel a bit disconnected and a bit lost and alone with this. But I think after a while you just do start to gravitate towards people with similar ideals and sometimes that can be nourishing enough 
that it doesn't mean you have to turn away from the other people. It can mean that you just connect to them differently. Maybe not with the feeling that they might share your values or that you're looking for any kind of um, deep friendship, but that you can bring some of your values to the interaction just by being kind. So you don't need to share Dhamma with them in a direct way, but you can just be an example to them and they start to see that something in you is changing. And maybe the time comes when they feel they want to ask you about that. But I think for that kind of, uh, that first stage, and also the whole way along the path, it's really important to start to try and um, develop spiritual friendships, come to groups like this, meet with the people, come to monasteries, um, you know, listen to Dhamma talks so that you don't feel alone, because it's very important to have people on the same path. And that's why all of you are here, right? Even if you can't meet in person, you can meet online, and it does help because we echo one another's value systems, we kind of reinforce our highest aims. So yeah, don't worry too much about the disconnection. I think it's natural in the beginning, but trust that you know the heart will mature, the heart will become more compassionate and understanding of others as well, and you might start to uh, find that the interactions get less, uh, um, there's less expectation, there's less clinging to them, but it doesn't mean there's less love. Yeah, hope that helps. Shall we go to Sean? And then Susie, and probably we might be done. Yeah. Thank you for the, you know, the meditation. I felt that really resonated and really some of the comments you made about acceptance and things really helped with some just like little niggles I have at the moment. And then the whole Dharma talk was really uplifting, inspiring. So. Thank you very much. But I also wanted to share something that's um, happened. So I was, when I came to stay at the Vahara, I had a particular situation with a client at work who, who I was having difficulty with. And when I was in the Vahara, I was trying to send meta to this person. And I had this whole situation that's been going on since. And then recently met up with them which was before one of the day retreats recently with Ajahn Brahmali. And again, I knew I had it coming up. So I was trying, I felt the sort of tension. I was trying to send Metta. And then I had a, a meeting with this client and they ended up, it ended up being a good meeting. Um, and they proposed as a sort of let's move forwards. Um, can you look just, it would just make me feel better if you make a donation to charity. Um, and so I thought, well, what better charity to send it to than obviously the project? And I thought it's kind of like, it's this amazing thing where through the project <laughs> Weird. and the teachings, it's kind of like come full circle. And I just thought it's it's like it's meant to be. It's sort of <laughs> incredible situation um so i just yeah i just felt it would be nice to share mm. oh. you say anything? <laughs> i don't know <laughs> the truth is stranger than fiction <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's the power of the mind we don't really know what how powerful the mind is uh but our thoughts have an impact that we don't quite realize how great it is. So, mm. yeah. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, and they said you choose the charity. That was the amazing thing. <laughs> choose the charity of your choice. Oh. Wow. <laughs> wow. Without consciously realizing wow. that the meta he was receiving was kind of, yeah. Wow. <laughs> he wow. was kind of actually, yeah unknowingly donating back yeah <laughs> it help with that yeah amazing yeah <laughs> thanks for sharing Thank it's very touching also that yeah. you asked for it to come here mm. <laughs> shall we go mm. to susie hello, hello. <laughs> um i'll be quick i just really wanted to express my gratitude um i feel so loved and held by the sangha today and um, yeah, the meditation was wonderful and 
the talk was really inspiring. So um, yeah, I just wanted to express my love for the Sangha, especially the Bikuni Sangha, <laughs> mm -hmm. especially the Bikuni Sangha in Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> We're feeling very yeah, love. <laughs> We're feeling very yeah. love. <laughs> and yeah, can't wait to um, give my service. So yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for expressing that. Everyone needs to feel loved and it's mm. lovely to be loved. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think also that what you're expressing is kind of devotion, right? Mm. It's a kind of reverence. Mm. Um, and mm. it's sometimes hard in English to find the right words because, you know, it's okay with bikinis. You can say you want to express your love it's harder to say it to a monk mm -hmm. <laughs> so i always look for the word to express my mm. feelings to ajahn brahm and i find that that's just not good enough english is not good enough but i think what i feel i guess the closest thing i feel is a sense of immense reverence mm -hmm. and incredible gratitude and it's mm -hmm. not to an individual although mm -hmm. it looks like we have to have a connection to somebody mm -hmm. human or at least i feel that right like venerable Rebecca was also mm -hmm. saying earlier that it's easier to have a connection sometimes to Sangha even than the Buddha because we can talk, we can relate, we can be around one mm. another and experience mm. that care and uh, really um, help each other on the path. So there has to be that connection but at the same time it's something deeper, it's something, some sort of echo of the Buddha and his teachings that you're seeing through the Sangha in some way no matter how we live it. I mean obviously we have to have a basic level of sila but even if there's not if we're let, yet to reach full awakening, there's an echo of the Buddha that lives on through the mm. through the monastic Sangha, and I think that might be what you're resonating with. Mm. So mm. it's very beautiful that you mm. do, and it's a sign of your own um, your own devotion, your own sadda. Mm. So that sadda is there. Sadda means like I think inspired confidence. It can also mean devotion, which is a nice translation, mm. or trust. Trust is nice. Lovely. Well, it's uplifting to meet everybody again after a while, especially uh, as Matthias said just now, it was a sort of spontaneous gathering, really. It wasn't, didn't have much pre-planning, but the tone felt that it was set almost from the outset. Mm. It felt uh, so lovely just to meet again in this way. And uh, just want to really sincerely thank everybody mm. for being here. Oh, and I'm inviting Shirley today to oh, say yes, a few yes, words at yes, the end. She's actually right. in the room. Mm -hmm. And after that, we're going to tell you about the next uh, events. Well, I'll tell you now that we're doing a day retreat, Venerable Pekka and I, in Cambridge on the 17th of June called The Wisdom of Forgiveness. And uh, after that, we will explain the next things. So come. You want the stage? The whole stage? You can have the stage. Yes. Wow. Hello everybody, I can now see your lovely faces and here I am on Wessac Day. Mm. I think this is the first Wessac in England at a Bikuni Vihara ever. Mm. At an actual, um, actual... We did one at the rented place. Yes, but this yes. is actually yes. uh, a place yeah. that is actually uh, belongs to the Bikuni Sangha. And... Um, Yes, and so many beautiful thoughts on this really, really beautiful and inspiring evening. And I want to say something about generosity, because generosity is part of the path. And generosity is something that can bring us great joy, can help reduce our craving. Uh, so it can bring personal benefits to us, but it, without it, uh, Venerable Chanda and Venerable Rebecca would not be here and they would not have a home and we would not have a Vihara to visit. So this is completely dependent on voluntary offerings, maybe of money or of service or of food. And um, so you can make donations on the website and also you can email Team Anokampa and you can look on the website to see how you can donate food and you can also contact Team Anokampa and 
to offer your services so maybe oh Matthias has already put it in the in the um in the box so that's um that's that's great so yes so yes so uh what you can give uh give uh if not uh if you haven't got anything to give if you're poor and haven't got any but everybody's got something they can give because we all give our presence which is beautiful and our devote and our devotion and our care and our love and support for one another so that's generosity too okay so that's all i have to say thank you Shirley. <laughs> So so lovely, isn't it, to know that we can all give something and also we can give something not only to us but we can take some of this on and outward into our lives and give people the beauty of our listening and our care and our patience and you know, just our good intentions, our forgiveness. And we can give those things to ourselves as well. So, yeah, I would just like to um, also talk about the events that are coming up. So that's also, yeah, Matthias has put the link for that as well. Uh, so for the events, I mentioned Cambridge. We still have the Friday uh, Sutta discussion groups. Uh, on Friday evenings, we still have the chanting. And we're both going to be leaving this Bihara around the 22nd of June. But after that, I'm getting, asking and inviting <laughs> some very generous bhikkhunis to offer some teachings in my absence. In fact, Venerable Upeka will be doing a couple during the following four months. So that's July to October. And some other nuns from Perth and at least one nun from California is doing one talk. But uh, another one who I asked last year is actually coming with me for the Vasa. So she can't do any talks uh, to you because it's kind of a silent retreat. So we will be offering some ongoing support even in our absence. And of course, I hope that you can also appreciate that one way of supporting the community is to deepen our own meditation practice because the deeper we can go and deeper more we can understand the more we can mm. share with you and for myself it's also a matter of physical recuperation so uh yeah give us more energy for the next stint and i just want to say in case we don't meet again soon that this last six months or so in the vihara has been incredible it started off with linda visiting which was absolutely beautiful, mm. wonderful for a whole mm. month. And she met many of the community. And since then, we just had wonderful guest after wonderful guest that just give so much of themselves and seem to inspire one another to be even better than they usually are. So the power mm. of being around like-minded people and how it can kind of really bring out the best in ourselves has mm. been incredible to witness. And also mm. I started to receive some of that nourishment, some of that joy. So it's gone from feeling like giving out, giving out, and then now suddenly we're just reaping the rewards, you know. It's really beautiful. Mm. And that's along with the sunshine and the plants that are blossoming and growing and giving off more new leaves, and it's a time of growth. So also there'll be an autumn and there'll be a winter mm. and things will go in waves, but mm. I think this has been powerful. And um, we do hope to have Venerable Upeka visit again and to hope look forward to seeing many of you also at the Vihara again, including our dear Derek, who, am I allowed to say, might be coming back? <laughs> anyway, he, he never left, but he might be coming geographically a bit closer again, which is lovely. Uh, he never left the community. He's always there on the team at anacamperproject.org <laughs> email address, giving his devoted service. So thank you very much to Matthias. Yes, Kim, there will be video recordings made because of our dear Matthias who's staying with us now and who's very diligently videoing everything and spending hours every day uploading, editing and making them available. This is all voluntary. It's all completely free. We don't pay him a penny except we allow him to come and stay here, not only because he's doing the videos, but just because he's so sincere in his practice. So uh, mm. just to realise how much work and effort goes into spreading the Dhamma to all, it's mm. really incredible. And as far as we can, mm. we endeavour to record everything we do. So whether it's worth it or not, we try our best. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because it's the demo. Yes. So mm -hmm. we'll record it. And there's always something there that helps someone somehow. So thank you so much for being here.
and lots and lots of metta and goodwill and good wishes to all of you here.